and you're on. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome today to today's Safety and Awareness Community Education event presented by Avenidas in partnership with the cities of Palo Alto and Los Altos and sponsored by Palo Alto City Council member Lydia Ku and Los Alto City Council member Lynette Lee Ng. It's been a frightening time for our Asian American community members. Avenidas and the Avenidas Chinese Community Center members have been reaching out to us with their concerns and asking for our help. We are happy to have this opportunity to work with the city council members and both city's police departments to bring this important program to you. The city council members will introduce today's speakers. Please put your questions in the chat. We are on a webinar, so no talking from the audience right now. So put your questions in the chat. We'll have time after um, the speaker's presentations to answer all of them if they're not addressed during the presentation. So Lydia Ku has been a member of the Palo Alto City Council since 2016, and we are happy to say is the council's Avenidas Liaison. And Lynette Lee Ng has been a Los Alto City Council member also since 2016 and has also served as the city's mayor. Thank you. Then uh, I am very happy to be here today and thank you so much uh, to Avenidas for sponsoring this very important and uh, much needed uh, session with uh, safety and awareness. Um, obviously, you know, we've been going through some trying times, uh, some scary times, and uh, we have decided that it is pretty important to feature our police chiefs and uh, to bring reassurance uh, to our communities. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Chief Johnson. It's my pleasure to introduce you, uh, the City of Palo Alto's Police Chief, jo uh, Bob Johnson. Uh, Chief Johnson started his law enforcement career in 1986, first serving the County of Los uh, Los Angeles for 27 years, then as the city of Menlo Park's chief of police for five years before his appointment to Palo Alto's police department in 2018. In addition to Chief Johnson's law enforcement training, he's also a certified uh, instructor for compassion cultivation training, a program developed in St at Stanford University. He is a trained mindfulness facilitator from UCLA's CIMOL Institute for Neuroscience and the Human Behavior. And he's a peer coach for resilience immersion training, a program designed specifically for public safety personnel and developed by the Mindful Badge Initiative and the University of California, San Diego Center of Mindfulness. Chief Johnson believes it's essential to provide personnel with the best training possible so everyone can live healthy lives that's physically, mentally, and emotionally while serving their communities. Thank you, Chief Johnson. Um, hi, I'm Lynette Liang, former mayor of Los Altos and uh, council member now. Um, I wanna thank everyone for making the time to attend this event, just as Lydia Ku has um, mentioned. The staff at Avenidas, Tracy McLeod and Pinky Fung. Um, thank you again. As um, council member Ku has stated, we have heard from many of our council members and many of the attacks that we hear about on the media is very troubling. So we are all very trusting individuals we want to believe everyone is well-intentioned and that we can assume that there is good in everyone. Unfortunately, with the troubling times, um, I can speak for myself as well, that I know firsthand because I have been a victim of anti-Asian sentiment. So I really understand how important today's event is for all of us. Um, it is important how critical it is for us to be aware of our surroundings and what to do if we find ourselves in an unpleasant situation. What to do if we encounter someone who is being attacked. Um, it is natural for many people whose immediate reaction is to assist and intervene, but we all have to be cautious. 
Um, so that's why council member Coop have called on experts. And so today um, I have the honor to introduce um, my chief of police of Los Altos, Chief Andy Galea. He joined our Los Altos Police Department in 2009. And in 2016, Chief Galea was sworn in as the police chief for the Los Altos Police Department. Chief Andy Galea continues to serve the community with professionalism and dignity. He has always been good about making himself accessible and we are pleased that he is here to join us today. He has served in many jurisdictions, Foster City, Menlo Park, and San Jose. And I don't want to go on about his career because I, it would take up this whole um, <laughs> webinar. But once again, I, I, I would like to welcome um, Chief Andy Galea. And thank you so much for once again, making yourself available to serve the community. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. And um, Chief Galea, we are fortunate to have representative, um, a representative from the Deputy District Attorney's Office, Erin West. And if you could do so, um, perhaps you can do the introduction or she would like to say a little bit about herself. Thank sure. you. Sure. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Erin West. I'm a Deputy District Attorney for the County of Santa Clara. I focus on um, cybercrime, but also on hate crimes. So I review all the hate crimes that come in for issuing in Santa Clara County. I've been at the District Attorney's Office for 23 years, and I've worked uh, on the hate crime unit for the past 10. So it's a pleasure to be here today and tell you a little bit about the trends in hate crimes and um, answer some questions about what a hate crime is versus a hate incident. And I'm happy to pass on any information I have and I'm really pleased that you asked me to be here today. Uh, we also do not want to forget Captain McCroskin from uh, the city of Los Altos who's supporting us today. So thank you for being here, Captain. And uh, with that, shall we start the program? And it's off to you, Chief Johnson and Chief Galea. Thank you. Thank you, thank you to all of you. I mean, we are very honored and uh, feel privileged to be here with you today. So thank you. Now I'm just gonna ask, and I think Kat's gonna help me and hopefully she gave me access. I'm gonna share my screen. So just bear with me for a moment. There you go, now I can see it. Okay, so Perfect. you should be able to see our main slide and I'm getting a lot of cues, so I think we're good. So again, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Bob Johnson, the Chief of Police for the City of Palo Alto. And uh, again, very, very honored to be with you today. You know, this afternoon, we're hoping to address and get in time uh, all of the critical, critical issues pertaining to violence that we're experiencing in America, specifically those impacting the Asian American and Pacific Islanders. We will address some of the most applicable laws uh, as District Attorney West will uh, cover. We'll also share some recent data. We'll talk about microaggressions. We'll provide some safety tips uh, that the Captain and Chief Galea will cover. And then hopefully at the end, we'll leave time for questions. You know, during the past year, without question, we've seen an unusually high increase in anti-Asian anti slurs and attacks and there was actually a recent article uh, in, in the New Yorker that I would encourage you to read. It was, the article was an interview, it was very interesting. It was an interview between the author and a professor of Asian American studies at UCLA. And while we all recognize that violence against Asian Americans may not be new to our country, in her article, she states that for Asian Americans, especially more in the contemporary times and period, it is times during national crisis that those fault lines erupt. And that's when we see violence spike along with anti-Asian hostility, legislation and attitudes. She also speaks of a very significant uh, incident that occurred and many of you may be aware of it in 1982 during the auto recession in Detroit. And that's the incident where Vincent Chen who was studying to be an engineer and he was the only son of a Chinese immigrant, Lily Chen was about to be married and went out with his buddies for his bachelor's party. 
Vincent Chin was uh, encountered two auto workers that evening and was killed during an incident. That incident, if you recall, sparked national outrage, fueling a campaign of justice to recognize Asian Americans as a legal class, as a minority class with a history of institutional racism, which would provide them ultimately with hate crime protections that could add uh, additional penalties to crimes against them. You know, and I'm really, really happy that Aaron's with us today from the district attorney's office. And many of you may have heard uh, one of her colleagues speak at a recent Stop Asian Hate rally, Jay Borowski, who's the chief assistant district attorney for Santa Clara County. And I'm also very honored to have Jay as part of our community advisory group in Palo Alto. But during that speech, he made a very impactful uh, statement, a few statements containing to the current situation we're experiencing in Palo Alto. And while we continue to send our thoughts and prayers to the victims of violence, it actually has to go beyond that. And we have to really start uh, working together. And one of the things that he said that really resonated with me is that while we can't go back in time and erase these horrific acts that we've seen and experienced, yet, we can take responsibility for our own neighborhoods and we can get to work in making them safer. And the solution to hatred, Jay said, is in our hearts and in our hands. We can't be against racism. We need to be anti-racist. And then with that, I'd actually like to take a moment and Council Member Ku, thank you for the introduction. I, I think I sent you just two sentences <laughs> but you expanded it a little bit and you talked about my work in compassion and resiliency. So if you would in engage with me, I think this would be a great time to just pause for a very brief moment. And I'd ask you, if you're willing to, to just close your eyes just for a moment, wherever you may be, and if you feel comfortable in doing so. And I'd just like for us to settle down for a moment and just start coming into connection with our body and our mind. Maybe taking in a couple of deep cleansing breaths, just breathing in slowly through your nose, exhaling through your mouth, breathing in and breathing out. And know as you sit here listening to the tone of my voice that right now you're perfectly well, you're safe. But as you're sitting here and just breathing and maybe calming just a bit, both in settling your mind and calming the body, I'd like you to ask yourself two simple questions. The first being, in your heart of hearts, what is it that you want in your life? In your heart of hearts, what is it that you want in your life? Now, whatever arose naturally within you is for you to hold. As you resonate and you connect with that answer, I'd like you to ask the second question. In your heart of hearts, what do you want to offer the world? In your heart of hearts, what is it do you want to offer the world? And let those answers just sit with you as you take a couple of more breaths sitting here, breathing in and breathing out, maybe feeling the relaxation in your forehead, your eyes, your jaw, your entire body. And then when you're ready, go ahead and open your eyes, come back to this space. And here we are today with numerous participants from within the region. And I don't know what the answer was that arose within you, but I could probably guess that for many, the answer is most likely wanting peace, happiness, justice, good health, maybe the right to feel safe in our own neighborhood. But unfortunately, as we sit here together, that is not what many Americans feel in their life today. Their lives are filled with anxiety, fear, concerns for loved ones. Just as I'm sure when Lily Chin's son, Vincent Chin went out to celebrate his bachelor party, 
Never in her mind did she think she would never see her son again. And there may even be for some of you, not only that concern for loved ones, but maybe even a, a sense of anger that hatred has become so prevalent in our society. And as the district attorney said, the solution to hatred is in our hearts and it's in our hands. So let's get to work and not just let those words die lightly. So I'd like to now pass it over to the deputy district attorney, Aaron West, who will provide an overview of the hate crime laws and hate crime incidents. So with that, Aaron, the floor is yours. Thank you. I have to tell you, I'm a big fan of meditation. We did um, we did some meditation work at the DA's office a couple of years ago, and that was a treat. So thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, I want to talk to you a little bit about hate crimes, and um, you can go to the next slide, Chief. And what you're going to see in the next few slides are a lot of numbers and a lot of words. And what I want to tell you is that hate crimes, I want you to leave here understanding the difference between a hate crime and a hate incident. So the difference between them is that for it to be a hate crime, there has to be a crime attached to it. So we have a lot of situations that take place in our community where there is some horrible language or a slur used. Um, imagine a road rage situation where somebody says something awful to another person. Or, um, you know, in the in people sitting enjoying a lunch and somebody says something horrible to them. That's a hate incident. That is um, an action that was motivated by bias and it's a hate incident. Now, if you look at the screen, it says a hate crime means a criminal act. So the difference here is we're gonna look at, for it to be a crime, we've gotta have a criminal act on top of it. So we've got the, uh, oh, my audio is off. Oh goodness, hang on, let me, um, one, one moment. Thank you, Megan. Does this work any better? Yeah, we can hear you, Aaron. But now you don't have my camera, so give me one second. Um, I could hear you before, too. You could? OK, well, now you, you, you get a double dose. Um, let me get my camera going. Perfect. OK, so now you can see me and hear me? Yes. OK. Yes. So essentially what I want you to know is you've got your hate crimes and your hate incidents. In order for it to be a crime, you're welcome, Megan, um, you've got to attach a crime to it. And the crimes that are going to generally go along with a hate crime are um, an assault and battery. So that there, an incident takes place, someone, um, and the incident takes place, um, sorry, I'm trying to get myself set up for you. Um, essentially because, because of someone's bias. Uh, Chief, would you go back to the, the slide right before for a sec? These are the Palo Alto slides and they have um, a great hate crimes person on staff who put these slides together and he does it so well. It's just a different order than I'm usually doing it. So let me tell you that when we talk about the hate crime, these are the different types of biases that we're looking for. This is a bias against a disability, a gender, a nationality, a race or ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, or a, an association with, with that. Now, let me give you an example. Um, the person does not have to be correct that that, that that is your nationality. So imagine a situation where um, a family is sitting enjoying a meal and someone yells at them like, you, you dumb Koreans, you should go back to where you live, but they're actually Chinese. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter whether the family is Chinese, doesn't matter if they're Filipino, if they're Latino, if they're white. It, if they were targeted because of that perceived actual or perceived characteristic, that's gonna be a hate crime. Okay, go ahead, Chief. So um, we use these different laws generally we are going to find that hate crimes are mainly misdemeanors unless the level of crime is such that it should be a, a felony. For example, 
Uh, we recently had a crime take place in 2021 at the Diridon train station where a, a nurse was on her way to work. She was grabbed from behind and the individual yelled, um, yelled an expletive about Asians and, it, and took her down to the ground and made some sexually provocative remarks to her. And based on the severity of that, we felt it was an attempt to commit rape and that it was based more than substantially on the fact that she was Asian. So because that was so severe, we charged that as a hate crime, as a felony hate crime. And I'll contrast that to the other uh, Asian hate crime that we charged this year where a woman was on Castro Avenue in Mountain View saying horrible things to people and spitting on them. So committing a battery and using a hate crime, we charged that as a misdemeanor based on the severity. So when you, if you look at the bottom where it says, per California law, speech alone does not generally constitute a hate crime. So that's what I want to talk about and leave you with today is the difference between a hate incident and a hate crime. So while the hate speech can be very offensive, that's gonna be a hate incident rather than a hate crime. Next slide, Chief. So when I talk about it being a crime, the, the common crimes that underlie it will be a threat. Um, of, oftentimes we'll see a situation where, um, uh, for example, um, another one of our anti-Asian crimes that took place last year was a man who approached a couple in a grocery store and said, um, you know, you it was, it was right after we got into COVID at times and said, you Chinese should go back to your country. And if I had um, an AK-47, I would get you right now. So that's gonna be a threat. Um, and 594 is vandalism. We see that a lot. We see um, anti, anti, some sort of bias in, in um, vandalism. And then I've already given you an example of a battery. Next slide. <coughs> Um, so again, here's the difference with hate, the hate incidents. These are acts of prejudice that are not crimes. So no violence, no threats, no property damage. Next slide. So uh, before I hand it off, I just wanted to give you I, what I hope to be some reassurance. Um, yes, we have heard a lot about, about what's happening in the community um, and I, and I know personally about people who are scared and concerned. What I can tell you is that we still live in a very safe place and that I have only issued two cases this year. Um, but I know you're alarmed and I know you're scared and that's why we're here today is to talk about that and, and to let you know what we're seeing and, and what, the, what, the, what we're seeing in the community. Um, so maybe we can help you feel a little bit better and a little bit safer. And um, I will now hand off to Chief Galea, who can talk to you more about feeling safer in your community. Actually, uh, I'm going to just jump in oh, for a minute you. on a couple of things. Thanks, Aaron. You know, the reason I'm showing you there, we're showing you this slide. And again, talk a little bit about the data. You know, and we will definitely leave time for question and answers regarding um, the, the difference between hate crimes, hate incidents. But there was also a really good uh, release of information last month and some new data that revealed over the past year, especially during the pandemic, the number of anti-Asian hate incidents as Aaron just addressed, um, which do include the shunning, the slurs, maybe physical attacks that would transition more into the hate crime, has been greater than previously reported. And a disproportionate amount of those attacks, which I think is relevant, uh, and important to understand, have been directed at women, such as the incident down in San Jose. And this research was released uh, really, and there's a, a website I'll share with you later from the AAPI hate uh, website, stopaapihate.org, revealed that over 3,800 incidents were reported over the course of roughly that year during the pandemic, our first year of the pandemic. And that's a significant number. And again, that's a national number. That's a significant number because it's dramatically higher than a year's prior. So one of the things, again, that when you look at the data, you'll find is that women made, a, made up a far higher share of the reports of um, about 68% compared to men. 
And um, so that's important to understand. But why I share this slide with you on the 21 day racial uh, equity habit building challenge is this is something that was conducted last month, or actually I guess it would have been two months ago, began in February of this year, put on by the city of Palo Alto and the Palo Alto Unified School District. And I thought it was an amazing, amazingly well done uh, program and it's still available. And I just wanted to share that with you because you can go in and explore it at the website. Uh, it's online, whether you go through each day for 21 days is up to you. But as you'll find within there, there's a lot of great pieces of information that are extremely valuable, especially for this conversation that we're having. And the one part that I really like uh, that I'm sharing with you is microaggressions, because I do think those are the types of situations that, especially in the Asian American community, and we can all be a uh, victim of microaggressions, but I think there's something that we're hearing a lot about today is that these things that are very subtle and maybe may not have any criminal intent behind it, but it doesn't mean it's any less painful. And again, so I leave that for you to understand because one of the things that I, I really believe with the microaggressions is that they're far more than just the insults and insensitive comments. Uh, there's something that's very specific and key part of what makes them disconcerting is that they happen so casually and frequently. And oftentimes, as I mentioned, maybe without harm intended, but it doesn't mean it's acceptable. And I think that goes to what we were speaking about earlier is we all have a part to play and making people understand what they say hurts and it matters and it shouldn't be uh, allowed to continue. Because again, I think a lot of people make insensitive comments without even realizing they had done so. So again, I think that's something all of us can do a better job of uh, confronting when we see it or hear it or are exposed to it. So one of the things that also came out and I'll share with you on the national level, uh, and you can see the website down there in the lower left corner. And the reason I share this is it's somewhat dated because it is two years old, but it's the most recent data that's collected by the FBI that's available for public dissemination. And why I share this with you is just to reassure you that whenever there's a hate crime or a hate incident, law enforcement uh, is required to report that to the national database. And every year they publicize it, so they just haven't finalized the 2020 data. But this is available, and what you'll see is there were a lot of hate crimes uh, nationally in our country two years ago. Nearly 16,000 uh, agencies submitted that data. And as you can see, about 7,000, 7,100 of those uh, incidents involved about 8,500 victims. Now, if you look at the big chunk of that pie, nearly 58% of those were targeted based on race. So why I share that with you is to give you maybe more of a national perspective and a, more interesting to the local jurisdictions, and Andy can share what's going on, Chief Galea can share what's going on in Los Altos, because I do know we have people from other cities. But why I share this with you is just to remind you, as uh, District Attorney West did, Santa Clara is relatively safe. It's a very safe uh, city and county. And in Palo Alto, it's extremely safe. And when you compare what you're looking at, these national statistics, which indicate what, if I were to do the math, about two thirds of the hate incidents or hate crimes uh, include assault, assaults or threats. And about a one third of those um, are against property. Palo Alto is almost exactly the opposite. What I mean by that, about two thirds of the incidents in Palo Alto pertain to property. And a vast majority of those are vandalism of signs or, or things of that nature. And to give you even more specific to Palo Alto is, you know, we shared at the Human Relations Commission a couple of weeks ago, some of our uh, data over the past 15 years. And the numbers are extremely rare, extremely small. We average about 3.6 reports, hate crimes a year uh, on the average from 2006 to 2015. That number from 2016 to 2020 has gradually increased. It's climbed to about 4.8. So we're definitely keeping an eye on these trends. But again, my message to you today is that 
even with that 4.8 number, it is very, very rare that we have an act of that involves violence. Almost always in Palo Alto, it is a property related incident. And that is most likely not going to um, calm anyone's anxiety, but I just wanted you to see some of the data. And uh, while the national statistics can be alarming, uh, we're going we want to continue to do our best in keeping Palo Alto and this region safe and low of violence as best we can. So with that, I would like to pass it on to Chief Galea and the captain to provide some safety tips. Great. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate uh, that good, good yeah. information. Yeah, Andy, this, this, uh, just one more thing for the group before I move to the next slide. This is something I spoke to earlier on that website. So I wanted to share that website with you. We won't be speaking to their um, uh, safety tips. I'll have uh, Chief Galea speak more specifically on law enforcement tips. But these are tips straight out of that website. So it's there for you to look at. They also have some safety tips on if you're a witness to seeing some uh, acts of violence or hate. So uh, we can always come back to this if needed. So with that, Andy, I apologize and back over to you. No, nope, thank you, Bob, great information. Uh, yeah, if I can echo um, what Bob Johnson just uh, uh, touched on, uh, we're very fortunate to live and work in two very extremely safe communities. And I, I think what uh, was described in Palo Alto is exactly the same thing we're seeing here in Los Altos. Um, very low numbers in terms of hate uh, incidents that are reported to us are hate crimes. What we what we commonly see, much like in Palo Alto, are vandalisms to uh, to signs or perhaps the uh, side of a uh, school building, uh, things of those nature. Uh, we're not, knock on wood, we're not getting and seeing the assaults that we're seeing making the national news uh, or even locally here in the uh, Bay Area. So I'm very uh, happy to uh, report that. Um, we want to be safe. That is something we all want. We want to feel safe. So what we're going to talk a, a little bit about today is to give you some tools and maybe answer some questions uh, for yourself and your family members and friends of uh, some things, uh, what to do, what not to do, and, and some things to think about before you per perhaps find yourself in that uh, situation. First thing is, no matter what, don't put yourself uh, in danger. If, if you are in an incident or if you're a witness to an incident, uh, be sure that you're safe. We would love and, and really need uh, good witnesses. And that would be my best uh, advice to you is be a good witness no matter what. If you're able to photograph, visit uh, or video the incident uh, safely, please uh, do that. Um, take notes of any information that you think may be valuable. As you know, uh, if you can get a, a license plate, a picture of a license plate or to uh, document it in some way, uh, I think that's really important to help us. Whether it be a hate incident or a hate crime, we, we would like to know who the individuals are. Giving comfort to the um, to the individual that may be uh, a victim, either an assault or uh, verbal harassment, um, is certainly very important and very comforting to that uh, individual. Um, getting others to help uh, in some way, if uh, just a comment, did any, does everybody else see that? Uh, did you hear that? I think could be very, very powerful that you're calling attention to uh, what is going on. And obviously, if it looks like uh, anybody is injured, may be injured, certainly when in doubt, please always contact the police department calling 911. And always, if you can, uh, stay until uh, either police or uh, fire or the medics arrive, giving that emotional uh, support to the individual. Uh, next slide, Bob. 
So how do I keep myself uh, physically safe? Um, if, if possible, try not to be alone. There's always safety in numbers. Walking with a, uh, with a purpose. Um, attackers typically will look for what they consider to be an easy target. And uh, someone walking slowly, not paying attention, head down. Um, and certainly as you've probably seen on the news, uh, people that are fixated on their cell phones uh, are just, and not being aware of their surroundings. Always, always uh, a, an easy target. Carrying anything, something in your hand. People are just naturally wary of somebody that is holding something in their hand because honestly, they don't know what it, uh, what it is. Staying away from dark areas where you can be more, more vulnerable. Always try to take paths that are well lit and areas that there are a lot of people. If you find yourself starting to uh, on a path where there's no one around, that is, uh, yeah, never, never a good uh, situation. And always trust your your sixth sense. If you if you're walking along and you're just feeling uncomfortable, unsafe, trust your instinct. And if you're uneasy, there's probably a very very good reason uh, uh, for it. Uh, next slide, Bob. And, um, and then also, if you believe you're a victim of a hate crime or really any kind of a hate uh, incident, call the police department. We need to know about it. If it's a crime, we need uh, to gather that information. We need to investigate it and, and, and hopefully locate uh, uh, the individual uh, involved. And, and hopefully we can turn it over to our... Uh, district attorney uh, for, for prosecution. Uh, getting medical attention for injuries always uh, important. Uh, and if you can document whatever words were, were, were spoken, certainly um, that's important. And as we uh, mentioning videoing or taking photos, always very helpful. And, and, and then lastly, saving any evidence that, that might in the, uh, aid in the apprehension uh, of the uh, criminal. Um, I have Scott McCrossin with me who deals a lot with crime prevention and emergency preparedness. And he, Scott's good at looking over my shoulders, make sure that I don't miss anything. So I'm gonna look at him now and see if there's anything I left out, Scott. Oh, thanks, Chief. No, I don't, you didn't, really didn't miss anything. A couple of things I just wanted to revisit real quickly where you mentioned getting other people involved if it's a hate speech type of incident. And the, the purpose of that isn't to get people ganging up on somebody, but I think the purpose of that is to accentuate the fact that the behavior is just not acceptable. And I think a lot of times people, uh, like Chief Johnson mentioned earlier, is they make statements that are just very casual. And maybe because of the, their upbringing or their surroundings on a day-to-day -day basis, maybe they don't realize that what they're saying is really appalling. You know, I've seen some of the videos out there in the last year that were appalling to me you know, being in law enforcement for 25 years now, just to see an adult that just appears to be a normal person in the community making the statements that they're making, even knowing that there's a, a video right in their face. It's appalling. And, and I think that really a lot of this is just getting the word out there. And, you know, people need to understand um, that their behavior is not acceptable. Um, we do a lot of training. You know, I, I appreciate that Chief Johnson talked about the fact that we're working together. The cities work together, the, um, the district attorney's offices work together, the uh, state legislators take this type of thing very seriously. Um, I can remember all the way back in the academy from the, you know, from the very first day, they were ingraining in us the, the importance of understanding cultural diversity. Um, and then that's, you know, that's developed over the years to where there's mandated state training, but we, we don't limit ourselves as police departments and municipalities to mandated training. We add training. We add training as we see trends occurring. Um, you know, I, I know from working with Palo Alto, they're very innovative in their, their training additions. We do the same type of thing. Um, we try to do outreach, you know, opportunities like this. We, we really appreciate it. Um, one of the things that we do in our trainings, we talk a lot about implicit bias. And that's, you know, that's really, um, that's, that's understanding the biases that all people can have. 
And these are things that they're, that are affected by, um, you know, maybe our upbringing, by the friends that we're, we're around, by our teachers, by our politicians, by the news media, by the movies we watch. All these things have an effect on, on how, how we are as people, on the, um, the biases that, that we may develop. And the important thing is, is understanding that we can have these biases, understanding where they came from, and then uh, Paramount is making sure that these biases don't affect the way we treat other people. Um, we, we do this training, we do it on an annual basis so that I, I feel very confident that in law enforcement, we have a very strong understanding of that. Um, some of the added training we've done um, in, in Los Altos recently, we did a two hour training on understanding and preventing uh, anti-Muslim hatred. Um, we did a training, like I mentioned, uh, just a month ago with, uh, with the DA's office, with uh, Aaron West coming out and training us on understanding and recognizing just the, the little intricacies about hate crimes that, that may be missed, that really should not be missed and need to be documented. Um, that's really all I would add, um, but I think, Chief, you covered the safety tips uh, very well. Thank you, Scott. Okay, you know, one of the things in wrapping this up, and, and we're all going to be available for question and questions and answer or period, question and answer period. But one of the things I, I think is really important, I think both the chief and the captain and even Aaron uh, addressed it is that, you know, even though there's pretty substantial data and some of that we shared with you today, um, but that's the information that we know of. There's, I think I speak for the panel as a whole. We really do believe that those numbers are probably a small fraction of actual incidents. And that's where there, it's a concern. And in Palo Alto and, and most law enforcement agencies, we've been reporting hate crimes for many years. And it's the hate incidents and the, the, the nuance as both Aaron and the captain spoke to where there's greater um, education to be had for all of understanding that because law enforcement usually goes out if there's not a crime they don't report it but when it comes to hate incidents that's an area that we've really started mandating uh 100 reporting of so we can capture the data but again we only know what's reported to us and that's where the the bridge really needs to be built is when you think or anyone whether it's friend family colleague thinks it's something, uh, they've been exposed to something or a victim of a crime. Um, and sometimes we, we try to calculate that in our head. Well, I don't think it was really a crime. I just think it was a very insensitive comment. Call us and let us come out and let us be part of that conversation so we can document it. And it may not be prosecuted as a crime, uh, but it may at least get documented as a hate incident. We started documenting all hate incidents in 2017. So we're getting a better understanding. But again, even though we've been marketing or, and that's not the right word, but advocating for the reporting of these incidents, we still believe there's a lot that's not being reported to us. And why we feel so strongly about that is because we're still hearing third, fourth hand of incidents that are happening, even in our own community, but never get reported to the police department. So before we can really, really uh, collaboratively address these issues, we have to start communicating a little better. So I'm hoping, and we're all hoping, that that's something we can move forward with. As we started this presentation, it's in our hands. So let's take advantage of it. Let's take advantage of the opportunity that we have in working together and just sending the message regionally that we just will not tolerate uh, this any of these actions, whether they're criminal or not any longer. So it's all of our responsibility to make this a community safer. Uh, and we're hoping that by spending some time with you this afternoon, we were able to answer uh, some of your questions and hopefully alleviate some of your concerns. But with that, I will go ahead and stop sharing unless any of my colleagues have something else they want to add before we open it up. Um, I'm seeing heads nod, we're okay. So with that, I'll go ahead and we'll open it up to uh, questions. Wait, um, um, Chief yeah, Johnson, that, yes. quick question for you and Chief Galea, and I think this would be important. I myself have not reported my incident, um, and so I just want to make sure 
are we encouraging people to report um, incidents of anti-Asian sentiments that are expressed or just hate crimes? I think this will help to clear up um, things and help to understand what should be reported. And I also felt that I myself didn't feel that it was elevated to the point of um, taking the attention away of the police just because I've experienced, you know, these remarks. Right. So well, and I'll answer and maybe Aaron and uh, Chief Glake can also chime in. Let me, and I'll say this carefully, so I don't overwhelm our communication center. You know, if, if it's something that doesn't, if it's clearly not a crime, you don't feel it's a crime, it's not an act right. of violence, very, very clear. If it's an act of violence, somebody assaults you, you take something as an immediate threat, you call us and you can use 911 to do that. It's the other incidents where you're, oh, that was just insensitive comment. Well, I would appreciate maybe not dialing 911 on those type of incidents, but definitely call us and we will have somebody come out and have a conversation. Because even at the end of the day, if we all agree that, well, maybe it's not something that rises to the level of a crime, we still want to start documenting it. And that's where it gets documented is a hate incident or maybe even a suspicious circumstance. But either way, the documentation is becoming very important to us. I hopefully answered, Aaron. Well, if I could chime in on that, I think it is important to document because, you know, perhaps somebody makes a rude comment to you one day, but then they see Lydia the next day and they uh, run into her with their car and say something horrible. And we, we, it, we have a difficult burden to, when we prove hate crimes is we have to prove that they did that substantially because of their hatred. So if we can then refer to your incident and say, well, look at what this person said to Lynette the day before, it's great evidence for us um, in actually proving our case. So in that way, it's very important. And um, also it's important for us to know what's happening in the community so that we know where to put our resources and who to reach out to, to let them know that you know, we hear them and we're there. And I'd also, I'd also like to maybe just reinforce that with, even if the officer comes out, they may, and I'm just saying may say, well, this doesn't really rise to the level of a crime. Don't accept that and say, well, I'd like it report. I'd like it documented anyway, to Aaron's point. We're advocating and we're training our officers to take reports, but I'm speaking regionally because I can only speak for what we're talking and, and teaching in Palo Alto but I do think there's people from other cities, other jurisdictions, they're gonna to have to connect with their law enforcement agency to make sure that they're all on, we're all on the same page. Yeah, and if I can just echo everything that has been said, it, it, hate incidents of any type uh, like Palo Alto, we wanna know about it, we would like to document it. Uh, chances are it's not a one and done that there may be some pattern. And if there is a crime, uh, certainly, Aaron is going to need to show that connection um, uh, going forward. So one more question on to that, Chief Galea. So if the incident happens in another city, you want individuals to contact that city and Typically, not their local police officer, just to clarify so people understand what they need to do. Exactly. Uh, we we typically just accept reports uh, for events, crimes, or incidents that happen in in the city. And most police departments are pretty good. If uh, let's say you're in Redwood City and you're back home right now, I think a lot of uh, police departments will accommodate a phone report, so you don't have to drive uh, back there. And if I could just add that there have been times when people did not feel that it rose to the level of contacting the police, but they did feel it rose to the level of contacting the local media. And that's, that's not going to be helpful either because we're going to get questions on why we didn't respond and then we have to research it and that, you know, things like this have happened. So it's really good for us to have that firsthand. And, and again, just to reiterate that it's, it's good to know what's going on in the community. Thank you so much. That's very helpful. Hi there. So we've got some questions in the chat and in the Q&A that we want to go through before um, we say goodbye to everyone. So one that came in very early from Virginia said, hi, my children wanted to provide me a pepper spray, but I'm against it. What do you think? Anybody? I, well, I, yeah, I, I mean, 
pepper spray. Well, Scott, you look like you wanted to answer. You want to go ahead and answer and I'll see. Well, if I, I, well, I did read that question earlier and I think somebody responded about um, having like a, a, an alarm or something like that. You know, it's, it's really up to the individual to make that determination, but you know, is it something where you're going to be able to go in your purse or in your pocket and pull out a pepper spray and be accurate with it and not spray yourself because I've been sprayed myself by pepper spray and it's not a pleasant experience. And then you disable yourself even, even more. But I, I like the idea of it, having a personal alarm. I've seen those out there. They're extremely loud. Um, and that's really the idea is to just draw attention and stop the, uh, stop whatever the incident is from happening. That would be my opinion. Um, is spitting on someone a crime? Yes. Yes. It is and we'll prosecute it. I mean, I, I in, in preparation for a lot of these different community meetings I've done recently, I've read over all of our hate crime report and I'll tell you a good strong percentage are spitting. And I think that for some reason that spitting goes along with just the the hatred that, that that's the most offensive thing they can think of to do. And that's a misdemeanor and we'll prosecute it. We do. Do you think the various protests, demonstrations and riots make hate crime more acceptable? Hmm. No, I mean, and I'll speak and, and I'm hoping I heard that question correctly. No, it's never acceptable. Um, if that's the way that question was being posed is, do these demonstrations, rallies make it acceptable? Uh, absolutely not. Hate crimes is, is unacceptable in any uh, form. So uh, again, maybe I misheard the question, Tracy, but. Yeah, no, that's, it, it, yeah. Protests, demonstrations, and riots are in quotes. So I don't, I'm not sure there. Marie, if you have any clarification on your question, feel free to enter it into the chat or the Q&A. Um, then we have another one regarding the incident. Comment on that for a sec. I, I'm okay. not sure. I'm not sure what Marie meant, but I think that what we saw in 2020 and 2021 was sort of a concept that it was acceptable to say horrific things, and we saw more and more and more of that in 2021. So in 2021, we issued more hate crimes than we've issued in years, years and years. And I think that if Marie was getting to the concept of, was there a cultural shift that somehow these, these hate speech was more acceptable? Yes, I think we did see that. Um, and then just to separate again, you've got your hate incident, which is the speech, and then you've got your hate crimes, which is when we pair it with crime. And we did see that. Yeah, and, and to that point, I actually agree. I do think, uh, and without getting political, I, I do think uh, there has been a shift in our society, our culture of things that are deemed acceptable to say, and they just aren't. And, um, you know, I think and I hope uh, that we can go back to a calmer, more respectful society. Um, you know, and even in council meetings, we see it, don't we? We see some words that are said uh, in open comment that are hurtful. And there's just not a place for that, but uh, that can always be an aspiration that we can work towards. Um, this is regarding the, the recent incident. I think it was in San Francisco. There were two doormen who did not take action to help the Asian woman being attacked. Um, the news reported that they were fired. Um, the attacker was a big man. Do you believe that these two men were wrong to not challenge the attacker? They closed the door to their building. Yeah, well, Andy, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm familiar with the incident. So I am, I remember seeing it. So I'll speak to my initial thoughts. And here's, I'll say this with somewhat caution as well. I don't know their policies, their protocols. Um, you know, what is frustrating for us at times is some stores, and again, I'm just speaking, I don't know this particular store's policy or their um, uh, protocols, but some stores have an absolute hands off on their security people, uh, security personnel engaging anyone outside the store, and even sometimes within the store. So again, I, I can't speak to that, but it was um, hard to watch. And I had been asked about that recently, if we see something, should we physically uh, intervene? 
And again, I just can't speak to the, your skill set. I would probably, as a chief, recommend, if possible, not to physically engage. Do everything to help the victim. But again, it, without putting yourself in harm's way, um, you know, we've seen also on social media some attackers challenge somebody, and that person happened to be a world-class wrestler or something, and that didn't end well for the attackers. But again, unless you're at that level. You should probably be a good witness, as the captain and the chief said, and do your best to help intervene when safe to do so. And no, regardless of the situation, the best thing you can do, whether you find yourself intervening, about to intervene, get help on the way first, if you can. Call 911. It takes just a matter of seconds. Give the address, get help on the way, and then do what you think you can do very safely. Um, from Andrew, should I report a hate incident that happened about a month ago? Yes, absolutely. Let me just see here. There's a few more new ones in there. Let me grab the new ones. I think we've got some people raising their hands too. Okay, that's everything there. Um, in the Q&A, we've got, does Palo Alto have online crime reporting or a website? Yeah, we just we just went online uh, earlier this year, so we do have that available now. Uh, I can share that link. I'll try to get that link. But if you go onto our website, you'll be able to see the on, online reporting link. Paul Walto is a little bit ahead of us, uh, and we don't have it yet. We're we're hopefully soon to have it, but uh, we're we're always happy to take a phone report uh, also. Okay, what is the quote unquote, line in the sand in determining hate raising reporting by the media when all you hear is one side and not the true journalistic reporting. Isn't that a hate incident? Well, I'll speak to, because, <laughs> you know, we in law enforcement, and I don't want to turn this into a conversation about law enforcement, we've been the recipient of a lot of um, criticism over the last couple of years. Uh, and there's times I ask myself that question, is, is it the responsibility of the media to provide fair and balanced reporting? Uh, and yes, that's an aspiration I do think that needs to be upheld. Uh, and it's not always. We're living in a different world of journalism to where anyone at any time can post their views and their thoughts. And as the district attorney said, sometimes there's a very fine line between the First Amendment uh, and the rights to free speech and what turns into something that could be extremely critical or hateful. So uh, again, it's a judgment call on, on many levels, I think, at times. Okay, thank you. And from Roberta, we have when Lynette Lee Ng was running for city council last year, she had many of her campaign yard side signs vandalized with bumper stickers saying racist, what was done to catch the vandals. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm familiar with it. Uh, it was uh, as it should have been. It was reported to the police department. We, we took a, a crime report, we took a vandalism uh, report, and we investigated it uh, as we would with any other crime. And uh, unfortunately, we had no witnesses and real, no physical evidence, uh, no videos uh, that we could identify the uh, perpetrator. I would have loved to had uh, some information to turn it over to our local district attorney here and, and have her prosecuted, but uh, without um, some type of uh, evidence or a witness, uh, we just had nothing to submit to the district attorney's office. But what I can assure you, we, we spent a lot of time and resources investigating it. Okay, thank you. And from Jean, we have, can you give me some examples of what I can say to the perpetrator in a hate incident? I know to remain calm and composed, but I really feel I like to say something to educate the person, to understand what he or she said was very hurtful and wrong without aggravating the situation any further. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna just chime in my perspective of that. You know, again, uh, in a perfect world, the, the, the offender would hear us but sometimes they're caught up in what I refer to as emotional intoxication. They're in such a rage over whatever it is that's act, act, uh, agitating them that for us to intervene in a calm and professional fashion sometimes does not 
come through. So I think to her point, it's very, very important to stay calm. And if the recipient or the offender is willing to listen, that's a great conversation to have. But in a lot of the times uh, of these incidents, they happen so randomly, so quickly. And again, the offender is in a state of mind where he's so agitated. Sometimes they physically are probably out of, they just don't hear uh, and they want to just complete the act and then get, get out of there. Um, but I'll, I'll leave that for my colleagues to answer as well. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Chief Johnson. We had an incident here locally in Los Altos. You may have seen it on the news. It's probably about a year or so ago at uh, a post office where uh, one of the con uh, customers was very agitated, uh, very uh, uh, upset at uh, Asian uh, postal worker and started using some very inappropriate uh, language. And there were a number of people in line that started making comments to her, drawing attention, just saying, hey, that's not right. Uh, shouldn't be doing that. She was so focused on whatever the issue was with her service, she, she was uh, in her own zone. She was not hearing anything anybody was saying, didn't even really acknowledge or respond to any of the comments and just walked out. Yeah, I, I really love the question. And the reason is that I think that that represents by and large what the public sentiment is on these types of incidents. And if we have more people that will stand up, and again, I would emphasize in that calm way, I agree with, um, with both of the chiefs that these people get so focused, they're probably not going to respond in a, in a positive way, but they, who knows, they may walk down the street, reflect on their behavior and realize, wow, I really behaved poorly. And, you know, it just takes little, little interventions like that to have a, a huge effect down the line, a domino effect, if you will. Great, thank you. So from DD, we have when incidents take place, can we take videos of that person or people to get a record? If he or they told us not to, we may get into concerns of privacy issues. I see Erin reaching for her. Uh, I was going to say, let, let me worry about the privacy issues. <laughs> <laughs> you collect the evidence and I will figure out what's admissible in court. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> you want to document what happens because we want to see it and we will fight for the court to see it. And you don't need to be worried about interpreting the law. So yes, please. And don't listen to anybody out there who tells you what you, well, I mean, if something's happening on the street right in front of you, they, they're not, they don't become the boss of what you can and can't film. Great answer. Thank exactly. You. All right, and Ingrid wants, um, says there are many reasons that Asians are afraid to report hate crimes. How do you encourage them to report? Hopefully, hopefully having events like these, certainly we try to get the message out in uh, news releases, uh, social media, not just about these type of incidents really, but uh, uh, all incidents and crimes. So we try to, we're constantly, I think it's one of our challenge in terms of law enforcement is, you know, really to affect change and to whether it be to solve crimes or uh, make a bad situation better. We need, we, the police department can't do it um, by themselves. We need um, to address a lot of these issues as a community and reporting it uh, is really one of the first steps in, in doing that. People should be very comfortable, hopefully very comfortable, um, contacting their local law enforcement agency, whether it be an online report or calling 911 or, um, or, or, or calling the business line to report what happened. Hopefully um, the communities of Palo Alto and Los Altos, our residents feel uh, a comfort level in reporting everything to us. And I'll just, uh, uh, as far as Palo Alto on that question, you know, we have a, a fairly diverse uh, department and we speak over 32 different languages. So if it's an issue of, you know, communication and you want to speak to somebody of a specific language, just ask us and we'll do our best to make sure we have an officer that responds that can engage you with whatever uh, way you want. Because um, that's important, but to Andy's point or Chief Kalia's point, it starts with that making that phone call. 
and we can't help if we're unaware of what's going on. So please, please don't hesitate to reach out and call us. Well, I just want to thank Avenidas for having um, an opportunity like this to really see our faces and hear us talk and say, you know what, we really do care and we want to hear. And if you don't think, if you did report it and it didn't go well, then, then escalate it and, and send it up to us so that we understand because we really do want to help you. And hopefully each of you, I see 62 participants, you know, I hope each of you will go tell two people about, yeah, I listened to this talk today and, um, you know, I think they really do want to hear from us. So I, th I think I will make that call. So I hope, I hope things like this let us get to know you and you get to know us. We've got one person with their hand raised. So Andrew, I think this is our teacher, Andrew. I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you, Andrew, so you can ask your question or make your comment. Go ahead, Andrew. Looks like he still might be muted. Yeah, yeah, I think he needs to unmute, ask him to Yeah, unmute. go ahead, um, you can unmute yourself now, Andrew. It should prompt him. Yeah. Anything yet? Are you still there, Andrew? <laughs> All right, well, if you come back on and unmute yourself, we'll get back to you. So I want to actually turn this over to Pinky Fung. Um, Pinky wasn't with us at the beginning. We had some technical difficulties, but Pinky is the uh, manager of our Abnidas Chinese Community Center. Um, so she's gonna do the thank you um, to everyone and tell you what's next. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Hi, everyone. Thank you for all the panelists today, especially um, thank you, Chief Johnson. Thank you, Chief um, Gavia. And then also um, thank you, Officer um, McCrossin and also DA, uh, uh, DA Attorney um, uh, Aaron West. We really appreciate your time. And of course, special thanks to um, Councilwoman um, City of Palo Alto, Lydia Ku, and, and also Nanette Ng. This is a very special event um, for uh, all of us starting this conversation together as a community. And we want to, as um, uh, Chief Officer um, was mentioned about, we're building the, the bridge um, to communicate with our community members. And um, we, we have so much more to do. And then uh, let me share my screen. Um, to also hope that we can invite um, from your friends to your family to your neighbors. Um, this event is upcoming event on next Monday, uh, April 26. Um, we will have this um, conversation uh, again, but it's not similar to this. Well, similar to this, but not exactly the same. Um, we welcome you all to join, but this session will be in Mandarin. And um, if you would like to um, get more information to this and you can visit uh, our website or you can email to us, accc at avenidas.org. I'm going to also type this under our chat. Um, so then you can also write it down as well. Um, Tracy, I see a um, couple more questions um, on the Q&A. Do we have time to do that or? Sure. Um, okay, there's one, it says, and I'm not familiar with this. Is it permissible to carry an Estrima stick on the street? E-S-D-R-I-M-A. I'm not sure I'm familiar with that. Yeah, E S C R I M A. I don't. I'm not sure what that is either. I think it's a form of uh, Filipino fighting, which uses a stick and um, different kind of um, pressure points. But it does use a stick. <laughs> I'm looking at Scott, who does a lot with defensive tactics. Uh, any idea, Scott? Is that uh, permissible to carry around? Uh, I will I will research that. Um, I know that my son has used these on me because he's in martial arts, so <laughs> uh, <laughs> they can hurt. Um, I, I will definitely have to research it because I know there are some uh, martial arts weapons that are not permissible unless you are um, actually in the midst of training. So I'll look into it. And I'll give you an answer back. 
Okay, I think that does catch us up with all of the questions. And then I um, just want to mention, in case you didn't see the chat, that um, this session is recorded and Kat will send it out to everyone who's registered. So for folks that missed it, or if you'd like to share it with your friends and neighbors and family, you are welcome to do so. Again, thank you all the chiefs and captains and DAs, and especially to council members, Li Ying and Ku for helping us get this set up. We're really, really excited that we were able to bring it to our, our members and guests. Yeah, thank you for Thanks. doing it. Should I see if I, I might just point out yes. something to the audience? Um, Chief uh, Johnson has posted our uh, phone number for the Palo Alto PD. Um, we have the emergency number, obviously, it's uh, 911. However, we also have a non emergency number, which Chief Johnson has posted, and he's also posted the website for online reporting. So please take a look and jot down those numbers. Thank you. Thank you for having us, Avenidas. And maybe Kat, you, if you can jot those down as well and include them in the email and, and Chief Pelea or uh, Captain McCrossin, if you wanted to send the Los Altos information, we can include that in the email that we send out to our folks who participated today. Be happy to do it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, again. We can't thank you enough for making the time to make sure our communities are safe and every individual as well. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you.